Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining our diagnostic training session today. And what you're about to see is a pre-recorded training session we did over in the United States. Uh, but be assured that the a lot of the material that we cover is really applicable to any automotive applications. So uh, just be aware that, it, it, yes, it, it is a lot of North American vehicles, but they will apply a lot of the same principles apply over in the UK as well. Now, if you do have any questions, if you're watching this during the premiere, you can just uh, leave it in the chat. We'll be monitoring live chat. If you're watching this after the premiere, then just feel free to leave a comment underneath the video and we'll get to those as we can as well. So my name is Jason Gabrinas. I'm one of Snap-on's diagnostic technical trainers. I've been in the training department since 2013, traveling around North America, helping techs and shop owners get the most out of their diagnostic equipment. Before I did that, it was a couple of years as a diagnostic sales rep at Snap-on, so I had 30 different franchisees I worked with, as well as the shops that they serviced in order to help everyone get the most out of their diagnostic needs. Then before I did that, it was eight years at Subaru, so I worked in a dealership, and over time, I guess, just became the default dyad guy in the shop. So I always ended up having the drivability problems, the intermittent problems, the weird wiring problems that would show up on those cars. And that's really where I cut my diagnostic teeth, was trying to figure out all those weird head scratcher type cars that would come into my mind. Then before that, a bunch of other miscellaneous wrenching jobs, been a little over 25 years under hood experience for me. Our topic today is oxygen sensor testing and repair. It's important to understand oxygen sensors and the role that they play in the fuel system on a vehicle, because this can definitely affect drivability issues. Uh, they may affect drivability issues and not throw a code. You gotta love those no-code diagnostics. So let's dive into what makes a oxygen sensor tick and how they're used. And the first thing I wanna talk about relating to oxygen sensors is gonna be fuel trims, the often misunderstood fuel trims. So fuel trim, what it is, is when a vehicle goes into closed loop, right? So in this case, we're looking at a closed loop where it just goes back and forth, back round and round and round. Uh, what the vehicle's computer is trying to do in that case is get my air fuel ratio to a stoichiometric 14.7 to one. So 14.7 parts of air to one part of fuel. Uh, you may hear that uh, spoken of in terms of lambda as well. So a lambda of one is 14.7 to one air fuel. So let's say we're driving along and the oxygen sensor, the front oxygen sensor notices, hey, we're a little lean. Lean means we have too much air, not enough fuel, right? So it's gonna say, all right, computer, we need to have a positive fuel trim. So positive fuel trim means we're going to add more fuel to the mixture to get it back to that 14.7 to one. And then we keep going and keep going. And then eventually maybe we get a little too far and then the oxygen sensor says, whoa, now we're too rich. So now we got to pull some of that fuel back. So then we go into fuel trim, negative fuel trim. So we pull some of that fuel back and then we pull back enough. And then it says, oh, no, now we're too lean. So now we need to add fuel and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. And that's just how it goes throughout the drive cycle going through the, you know, with, with the vehicle, always trying to keep it to that 14.7. So our oxygen sensor relates by course telling the short-term fuel trim what to do right so the oxygen sensor reads rich says i need less i need a negative short-term fuel trim it reads lean i need a positive short-term fuel trim and as the short-term fuel trim is moving up and down the long-term fuel trim is learning oh this is how the engine is running now so if i have a constant over time short-term fuel trim that's positive say 10 percent or something like that over a decent amount of time then the long-term fuel trim is like, oh, well, I guess that's just where it is now. And then it moves it up and then it says, okay, well, this is where we're at now. And then the short-term fuel trim goes back to, you know, plus or minus 1% or 2% or what have you. And then if it goes excessively in one direction, then it tells the fuel long-term fuel trim, hey, we need to go up again. So the short-term fuel trim is instructing the long-term fuel trim as to what's going on in the vehicle. And I can use that to determine if there is some sort of an issue in the fuel system. So long-term fuel trim, definitely take a look at. If it's way too, if it's, say double digits in either direction, or at least close to double digits in either direction, you know you have to address that problem. If it's way too positive, then you know you got a lean condition. If it's way too negative, you know you got a, a rich condition. Uh, 
Short-term fuel trim can be useful for that in a as a short window as the as the vehicle is running right now. What is it doing? Right, so is it too rich or is it too lean right now? So this is a right now, and this is an in the past. So let's talk about the couple different types of sensors that we're going to be dealing with on a modern. So we first up are our basic zirconia sets. So this is a sensor that does exactly what it says on the tin. It senses oxygen in the exhaust. And depending on how it's set up, this is one of the early ones, you know, single wire, and it just plugs in probably off of GM. And then this one's a more recent one. It's got a heater circuit built into it as well. So you got a signal and heater and uh, power and ground for that. Uh, notice how it looks a little bit different on the end too. Because this one's heated by the exhaust, this one's heated by the so it produces a voltage, and that's why we can get away with just one wire on those old school one wire sensors, because it just generates a voltage. The actual membrane itself, in the presence of oxygen, will generate a voltage. It's going to be anywhere from about two tenths to about eight tenths of a volt, maybe a little more. This, this one says range about zero to 900 millivolts. It's usually a little north of zero, maybe 0 0.01 or what have you. Um, it is most accurate halfway in between, so 455 millivolts, give or take, is roughly 14.7 to 1. And because of that, we talked about the closed loop operation. The ECM must switch by this. So if we look at the way this is designed, I have these electrodes here that gas can go through, as in gases, uh, vapor, what have you. Uh, so we got our exhaust gas on this side, and then we have reference air on the outside. And that's another important thing that needs to be assured that it gets access to that reference there. So on an auction set, let me back up here a little bit. Oftentimes it goes through, say like this crimp cap right here, right? It'll actually get, get in and get through that. So if it gets bent or damaged at the top, or maybe I might have some vent holes in the top or something, depends on how it's designed. But if I get a crimp or, you know, it gets crushed, gets bent, gets hit by debris on the road, whatever it happens to be, or, you know, maybe the kid moving the exhaust up and down and trying to, trying to do a repair or whatever, that can affect how the auction sensor works. Of course, you'd still have to replace it, even though it's nothing electrically wrong with it, but uh, it does need that outside reference air as a reference to see, okay, well, here's what the air is doing where I'm at. That also helps with altitude too, if we got a little bit different uh, amount of oxygen, depending on where we're at. So at sea level, uncoincidentally, uh, pressure at sea level is 14.7 PSI. 1.7 PSI, 14.7 uh, to 1 air fuel ratio, which kind of makes sense. So like we said, an ideal air fuel ratio is 14.7 units of air to 1 unit of gasoline, which is approximately reads out at about 455 millivolts. Its accuracy range is between a narrow band of voltage. That's why you may also hear these called narrow band oxygen sensors. And if I were to hook up to it with a scope and take a look at the voltage coming out, it would look something like this, switching back and forth, you know, a tenth of a volt, about nine tenths of a volt, somewhere in there. Uh, we're going rich, we're going lean, we're going rich, we're going lean, we're going rich. Be able to see that as they go up. Now, AF sensors are similar in idea, but totally different in execution. So, air fuel ratio sensor, as you see, it looks very much like the oxygen sensors we were just looking at, uh, but with one. Big difference. It's actually two oxygen sensors, two zirconia sensors. So you have a zirconia membrane like we would have over in the in the uh, zirconia sensor, and then we have another zirconia membrane over here that has a gap in. Still have the exhaust gas, still have the reference there, and then in the middle we have this chamber. So what the computer tries to do in this case is it tries to keep this oxygen sensor segment, the membrane at 0.455, so stoichiometric. How does it do that? Well, it tries to keep this monitoring chamber in here at stoichiometric by pumping oxygen ions in and out. Depending on how much current is flowing through this pump and then how which direction the current is flowing, positive or negative, it can pump ions in and out from the exhaust gas into this monitoring chamber and always trying to get that at 14.7 or lambda of one. By doing so, it would force this membrane to read 0.455. So it's always, always, always trying to keep it at 0.455. Now, 
depending on the manufacturer, you might get a couple different readings. A lot of times you're going to see like a three ish volt uh, voltage reading on a PID, or you might just see a one volt reading that varies slightly. So it depends on how the computer does the math, depends on like the manufacturer, how it does that. But as I said, it's two zirconia cells mated together in planar form. So it's like a sandwich. It's like a monitoring chamber sandwich. The AFR sensor used an entirely different operating strategy than the conventional zirconia sensor. One cell is used to measure the oxygen content in the exhaust system. The other one is supplied with a very small electric current from the PCM capable of moving ions in and out. This current achieves a stoichiometric ratio between both cells. It's known as a pumping cell. Also due to this, it must operate at a much higher temperature. The zirconia standard zirconia sensor is like 640 degrees. This one operates at like 1200 degrees and almost always they're gonna have an integrated heater to get it to that point uh, quickly. And here's just a uh, artist's rendering of that. So we get our measuring cell here, which we're always trying to keep at 455. And then the PCM does all the math that's needed. And then it sends it out as a pump. So it either pumps it in or pumps it out depending on um, oxygen ions. But with that, as the PCM monitors the varying current, the PCM then converts that current into a voltage value PID. The best way to test an AFR sensor signal is by monitoring that AFR voltage. So to do an air fuel ratio sensor, you're probably gonna be just doing scanner stuff. You're probably not gonna be using um, lab scope because you can't really directly uh, measure the voltage and the current is so low, it's a very low milliamp range. You're not gonna pick it up with a low amp probe. Probably uh, it would need a milliamp probe, which are not that easy to come by and they're pretty pricey. So uh, just easier to look through the, um, through the computer. So in this case, we see a bias voltage. So it's usually got a bias voltage on the line anywhere from 2.9 to 3.3. 3.3 is considered stoichiometric and then it can go all the way up to four and then all the way down to 2.4. And then that is your corresponding air fuel ratios from quite lean to quite rich and anywhere in between. Uh, OBD2 voltage you should see theoretically is this. Um, I know like on my Subaru, we're gonna see that in a second. Uh, it tries to keep it at one. So a one, I guess it would be like a Lambda read, I suppose is what they're trying to, trying to tell you it is. It's, it's one volt is what they try to keep it. Uh, and if it's rich, I'll have negative current flow uh, down to a 400 to 100 milliamp output. Stoichiometric would be about 500 milliamp output. And then lean will be up to like 900. The thing to remember about Zirconia sensors versus air fuel ratio sensors is their opposite. And I always get this screwed up too, by the way. I just don't, for some reason, it just doesn't stick in my brain how, how it works, but um, oxygen sensor, so we're meaning zirconia sensor in that case. When the, when the uh, mixture is rich, voltage is high on a zirconia sensor, voltage is low on an AF sensor. When the mixture is lean, AF sensor goes high, uh, zirconia sensor goes low. All right, so you're going to see an opposite of that. And let's look at what we see right here. All right, so this is, like I said, it's on my Subaru. Rear oxygen sensor on that is a zirconia type. So at, uh, this is just at an idle right here on the left-hand side of the screen. So at an idle, it should be reading rich. And why is it reading rich? Because it's used, the catalytic converter has done its job and it's used up all the oxygen in order to do it stuff or most of the oxygen, the majority of the oxygen. So all the oxygen is used up, so it's gonna read, read rich in the back behind the cat. We're gonna talk more about cats here in a minute. Air fuel ratio sensor wants to be roughly one. So over here, if we look, it's like 1.99, 1.99. So that's a voltage and it. You see, it's not a huge range, 0.84 to 112. So it's like 16 on the negative and 12 on the positive where, where it goes. And this is when I opened a vacuum leak on the car. So I took the brake booster hose off the uh, intake manifold. So this is our short-term fuel trim. This is our long-term fuel trim. Now being a Subaru, uh, one thing that I do want to note if you work on them is that they don't call it short-term and long-term fuel trim. If you go in the generic data, it will, but in, uh, in the OEM data, it is air fuel correction and air fuel learning, which makes sense if you think about how they work. So air fuel correction is my short term. It's correcting the fuel as we're driving down the road. 
Whereas the short-term fuel trim, remember what I said before, teaches the long-term fuel trim what's going on under the hood. So we have correction and we have learning. So we pulled off the hose and this got all the way up to 35% positive. And notice how the rear zirconia sensor goes way lean all the way down to zero. And then the air fuel ratio sensor goes way up to 112. So you can see how they mirror each other. The AF sensor goes up when it's lean, the rear one goes down when it's lean. And then once we put the hose back on, you'll see it just drops off like a rock and it goes to a negative air fuel correction because now we're too rich because it was pumping that much fuel in there and now it went way too rich. So we see this thing bottoms out at 0.84 for rich. And then this one goes up to 0.9 for rich. So they reflect each other. So you can kind of see how it goes. And like we said before, another difference is that it's, it's roughly double on an AFR sensor. So it's 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, versus about 640 degrees Fahrenheit or zirconia. Very critical. So a special pulse width controlled heater circuit is often used for precise heater control. For example, the one I always talk about is the uh, resistance learn reset on a GM product. Pretty much any GM, 06 and newer, has this function. And it compensates for the wearing out of the heater circuit inside the oxygen sensor, long and short of it. When you replace any oxygen sensor on a GM vehicle, you need to do a code clear with the scan tool, regardless of whether or not there's a code, and then an HO2S heater resistance learn reset with a scan tool where available. Pretty much anything L6 and newer, like I said. Uh, perform the above in order to reset the oxygen sensor learn value to avoid possible oxygen sensor failure. What you're going to do is you're going to over send too much current to the heater circuit, and it's going to blow the heater circuit. So you need to make sure we do and it's very simple. You just go into the reset. You click a little button on the screen. Notice how it shows you all four oxygen sensors on that. And the reason is it's going to reset them all. There's no picky and choosy which one you're going to reset. You just reset them all. And then it learns, depending on if you only replace one, it just relearns everybody back to where you need to be. So no big deal on that. Also on Nissan vehicles, not sure how far back this one goes, but on Nissan vehicles, they have a similar type system but they don't have a specified reset for that. So what it is is a uh, self-learning control value reset. So this function allows mixture ratio self-learning control value to be cleared. Improper use of this function may cause poor drivability and ECM self-learning is completed. So this is on a 2022 Nissan Rogue Sport, also known as a Koshkwai otherwise in the world. And it's gonna give you your AF, our air fuel ratio there, both banks, you hit continue and it goes through. I'll show you that. Another place where oxygen sensors are used on a vehicle is going to be for catal measuring catalyst efficiency. So it is going to tell me whether or not the proper amount of oxygen is being used up inside the catalytic converter. So I'm not going to go through a whole dissertation on how a catalytic converter works, but all the bad stuff goes in, and then the not so bad stuff goes out. You know, you get some oxygen, you're going to get some oxygen, but not a lot. It uses oxygen in the oxidation chamber. Uh, bonds hydrocarbon and carbon dioxide to form water and CO2 and nitrogen. Right? So um, we shouldn't have much oxygen left over when we're done. So that means we can use oxygen sensor data to tell whether or not our catalytic converter is any good, or at least get a good idea as to whether or not it's so what you're going to need is you're going to need to pull up your rear O2 sensor, your front AF sensor, or O2 sensor, depending on what it's equipped with. In this case, I wanted throttle angle because I wanted to make sure my throttle was steady and my vehicle speed because uh, I need to go a steady vehicle speed. as well. And that's really all you need. And if it's one bank, then that's it. If it's two banks, then, of course, oxygen sensors on both sides. You can do them alternatively, what have you. Uh, but we need to have the front, and the front and the rear, and then we need to have the... Uh, uh, steady speed. So what you're going to do is you're going to drive the vehicle for like two minutes at a steady state, steady speed, steady throttle angle, 45, 50 miles an hour, and just go nice light throttle down the road. So this 18% throttle angle, that is not accelerator pedal, that is throttle blade, throttle blade uh, opening. So you see nice steady throttle the whole way, nice steady vehicle speed the whole way. In turn, I'm getting a nice steady air fuel ratio sensor. So that means everything's kind of working the way it should. 0.99 to 1. And then this is the one you want to look at, though, the rear oxygen sensor. So in this case, I'm at 0.8, which is almost full rich. So there's some oxygen left, but not a lot. So that means it's working. 
especially if it's a level line. If it was not working and not doing what it's supposed to do, it's going to go up and down. You're going to see a lot of noise. Like it, it just goes up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Because auction sen the catalytic converter is not doing anything. The auction sensor is basically reading all the emissions that are coming in the front, coming out the back. So if it's both zirconia sensors, they're probably going to match each other pretty close. Uh, if it's an AF sensor, like we said, it doesn't move that much. So you're not really going to see it there, but you'll definitely see it in the back. You'll definitely see it in the back. Also, make sure it's a post-cat oxygen sensor, by the way. That just popped in my head. Because uh, um, I know on, in my experience, some Subarus had five oxygen sensors, and it had three cats. So the first one was right off the engine on both sides. Second one was behind the first cat on either side. And the third one was in front of the back cat on the white pipe. So that wasn't monitoring that cat in the back at all. So if it failed, you're just, you would have to be one of the front two because it wasn't monitoring that back cat at all. I don't know why, but that's just how they designed it. So just be aware that you need to know where the oxygen sensors are actually located on the vehicle too. So um, we drive a steady state, make sure it's straight. That's what you want to do. Now, another thing we can do is we can also check for a lazy oxygen sensor. So if you come over here, you'll notice I went down to, took my foot off the pedal, started decelerating. When that happens, what happens? The fuel injector is cut off on most modern vehicles, right? To save fuel. So as soon as you lift off the pedal, go 100% off or 0% pedal throttle input and watch the sensors. The front one should go lean before the back one does. Makes sense, right? So there's a, there's a distance we're measuring over time. So you notice how the front AF sensor goes lean right away. And then the rear one kind of lags, takes a little while. Now there is a spec for how long it should take and it's gonna vary from vehicle to vehicle. But um, if your front one goes lean after the back one, that's a problem. So you know your front one is not reacting fast. So there's a couple different things you can tell just by doing this one little road test. Pretty simple. I like this one, very helpful. All right, and there we go, full lean. All right. Let's go live on the tool here and look at a couple of things. Oh, got disconnected. Shouldn't take too long. Didn't take too long at all. There we go. So first one I want to go through is the, I got an Acadia here. And that'll have that heater learn there. All right, so that is, uh, if you have a tool that has the service resets and relearns quick menu, you can go in there or otherwise you can go in the engine. So I'm gonna go in the quick menu and you can go down to replace or relearn the auction sensor. And then if I go into functional resets, it's gonna be, it's gonna give us a couple other things that we can do like turn the heaters on and off. But in this case, we got the heater learn right there. Talked about earlier. On the next clean select reset, continue. It'll give you the current current on each oxygen sensor heater. So let's say I just replaced the one. Well, when I hit reset, it's gonna reset them all, resets them back down to factory. And that way they can just relearn whoever needs to go wherever they need to go. So, yeah. Right. Oh, let's talk about inside guided component tests too before I go any further. So in guided component tests, if you have a tool with a scope, snap on tool with a scope, you will have the guided component test module in there. And when you go in there, before you ID a car, there is a classes tab. So if you want to learn more, you can go into how to, go classes, how to, and then all the way at the bottom, or pretty much all the way at the bottom, is going to be oxygen sensor feedback and feedback system analysis. So it's going to give you things like, here's how an air fuel ratio sensor works. Gives you all the different things to go with that. Correct PCM response, heated oxygen sensor, non-heated oxygen sensor, open and closed loop oxygen sensor types, Understanding oxygen sensors, pre-catalyst, post-catalyst oxygen sensors, what they're supposed to do. So you will see that in there. Plenty of uh, learning to be had in there. And then also, if we wanted to go in, let me pull up my. Multiple ways to test the sensor in here as well. So if I go into engine and I go into my oxygen sensors and they have both fronts, both rears. Uh, in this vehicle, actually, in this case, we actually have a location image as well. So we have those new location images that we've been putting in, showing you where it is. Um, also, component information. So 
So heated oxygen sensors, 450 millivolts reference, we can see them. Should be over 600 degrees, et cetera. Heater tests, you're gonna do a DC voltage test you can do. And then oxygen sensor tests themselves, you can do pre and post cat O2 tests, system response, O2 response, in-car tests, a bunch of different tests. That you can do. I have to pull up my rogue sport. Like I said, otherwise known as a quash quiet elsewhere in the world. It's going to be the same thing, just going to do something different. Uh, and in this case, you're going to have under the service resets and relearns menu, you will also have a reset engine adapt or reset fuel trim if you want to do that as well. Or reset engine adapters. If we go in here, functional resets and calibrations. I'm just going to pull up my engine here. And you will see self-learning control. That's what we want to do. So this function allows mixture ratio self-learning control value to be cleared. Improper uses of this function may cause poor drivability when ECM self-learning is completed. They recommend you do this after you replace oxygen sensor. It's not like a heater reset, but it resets the parameters back. And actually, somebody asked me on the last class, like, well, what other vehicles have this? And like, I'm not 100% sure, but... If you have a fuel trim reset of some sort available, when you do an oxygen sensor, I would suggest doing that just to get your starting point back to where it needs to be. Um, just so in case it was like way off because of the oxygen sensor, it's gonna bring it back to the starting point where it needs to be. I'm gonna hit continue, key on engine off. It's gonna give you your trim percent or your uh, percentage, continue, and it's done. It just brings you back to the main menu and you're done. Simple enough. Also, one more thing to note is you want to be sure that you're looking at the correct thing when you get a code on an oxygen sensor. So for example, let me look up the DC DTCs on this. So we have like a P0031. Those are heater circuits for the AF sensor. Right, voltage signal transmitted from AF sensor one heater to ECM is higher or lower than the voltage in the normal range. So that is an electrical problem. Could either be in the sensor itself or it could be in the harness or connectors. So just be aware. Otherwise, I could have, there's an oxygen sensor here, there too, um, AF sensor. So this is, uh, let's see. Output voltage compared to ECM uh, AF sensor one signal is constant. So that means it's kind of stuck. Uh, oxygen sensor, PO137. Uh, much longer switching time between rich and lean than air fuel ratio sensor one. So that's an actual internal problem. That is not a heart heater problem. That is an internal inside the oxygen sensor problem. So we want to test the oxygen sensor, right? So depending on what you get for a code, you always want to check that description because you could be improperly diagnosing or improperly swapping the parts. Because if I just swap out a part for P0031 and it's not the heater, it's a relay or it's something in the harness that goes to the heater that is incorrect, then I replace the, the sensor, it's going to be the same problem if it's in the harness or if it's the relay, or if it's one of the other things, right? So you gotta be aware of that as well. Now, if I look at this vehicle, by the way, number four code on that is O2 sensor delayed response. So you can see, you know, what do you think the top repair is? Probably gonna be replaced the oxygen sensor, right? Also could be a reprogrammed powertrain control module. Somebody did a mass airflow sensor. Uh, OEM testing is going to walk you through those test procedures, right? So response time of the AF signal one signal delays more than specified time computed by the ECM. And that's going to walk you through how to do it. And it says you need to use a scan tool. Um, and then remove and replace. If there is an after the fact thing that needs to be done, it'll be in there as well. All right, here's an interesting one. So discard any AF sensor which has been dropped from a height of more than half a meter onto a hard surface such as a concrete floor. Use a new one. So that could be to dent it. That could be, you know, just maybe you break the element inside as well. So I thought that's interesting. There's resistance values that you can measure and stuff like that. So lots of different testing can be done. Oh, let's look at the wiring diagrams too. 
Uh, oh, that doesn't have it on that one. Oh, well. Nissan's repair data is not the best from Nissan. Oxygen sensor circuit low voltage. There we go again. That is a circuit code. So it could be the sensor or it could be in the supply circuit, which if I can't, wrong, wrong diagram. I went the wrong diagram. That's why. Wiring diagrams. There we go. Wiring diagrams. Click on the right button. It might work too. So there we go. There's my oxygen sensor downstream, air fuel ratio sensor in the front. And then it provides you all the information as to what those wires do. And then you test it. You got a component test. All right. So that is oxygen sensors. And with that, that is our time here today. So uh, make sure you tune in for new diagnostic content every week. We will be premiering a new video every Wednesday at 7 p.m. UK time. So make sure you check it out on the YouTube channel. If you're watching, well, of course, you would be watching this on YouTube, but make sure you subscribe, thumbs up. Uh, ring a little notification bell so you know anytime we post new content and it's youtube.com slash snap on diagnostics uk with that time for questions if you have any questions just feel free once again if you're watching this on a premiere just leave it in the live chat and we'll answer those otherwise uh, leave a comment under the video and we will get to those uh, as we monitor those comments as well so i'd like to thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your day to learning a little bit more about how you might be able to be more efficient at diagnosing vehicles using some of the information that we've given you today. Hopefully we'll see you next week. Hopefully you can watch uh, and see you on any of our other videos. Have a good week, have a good night, and take care.